Good afternoon. It's Monday Hill Robinson. Y'all, what's up? I'm filling in on Indisputable for Dr. Richie, and I'm joined by none other than Big Wozni. Lombri, what's up, bro? How you doing? I'm good, man. Happy to be on with you. Uh, this is our first time ever, so we're kicking it off right. Looking forward to it. Yeah, man, we got a lot of craziness to get into, and why not start with the king of crazy? Last night, y'all, Donald Trump lashed out at a New York Attorney General, Letitia James, over the fraud trial currently playing out. Then posted a link to her home address, despite already being under gag order in the case. Trump was in court on Tuesday for the continuation of his fraud trial, during which he took the occasional opportunity to rant to reporters about the case and about the gag order that was imposed by federal district judge Tanya Chotkin. And in another case on Monday, that's on top of the already narrow gag order that another judge, that's Judge uh, Arthur Ingoron, placed on the fraud case. Uh, Big Wise, what, 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 what do you think about Trump and how he's going to get himself in a lot of trouble as it pertains to posting someone's gag order, especially when he already knows that his followers will take that information of this person's address and run up to her house and probably try to do harm? Yeah, I mean, it seems like this is the only tactic that he knows. All he knows how to do is lash out, gag order or not. Um, I think Donald Trump has demonstrated over and over and over again that he doesn't care about the rule of law, doesn't care about an injunction, he doesn't care about whatever. He, no court is he afraid of. Every single time they put charges on this guy or every single time, you know, another investigation arises, he's been pretty defiant about it. And that's the posture that he takes. So I don't think we could be surprised at this point. There's, at no point has Donald Trump done anything but be defiant in the face of, you know, allegations and charges against him. And this is no order. I think the extra step of posting the address um, of this prosecutor, I think is, you know, just another level of heinous on his part. But, you know, luckily, man, prosecutors, they get they get to keep a gap. She's going to have a security detail. And, and, and I think her and her family, they'll they'll manage to be safe from this. Luckily, she's not some random civilian who would just be at the mercy of Donald Trump and his rabid supporters. And, and you're right about that. And I think you're right about the point that nothing will stop Donald Trump. And speaking of nothing stopping him, uh, Think about the Trump, like he continued his attacks into the night, including one of these posts on his true social media posts. And that it didn't clear, like we said, a link. Check this out now, Awaz. It had a link uh, to a smear piece by white nationalist Laura Loomer. And everybody that don't know, if you don't know who Laura Loomer is, you should definitely dig into that because she's a doozy. But here's what Frank, um, here's what Donald Trump actually tweeted on his, uh, not tweet, he truthed it on his truth social. Her fake case, talking about Letitia James, her fake case against me should be dropped immediately. My financial, my financial statements are extremely conservative and her numbers were way off, way off, of course, including the fact that she undervalued mar logo and Doral by billions of dollars. She also didn't reveal the 100% disclaimer clause at the front of the financial statement and sued me under a statute that was never used before. Miscarriage of justice and election interference all wrapped up in one. Um, listen, can we can we just be honest that everything against Donald Trump is election engineering or interference and and also everything about him is perfect. This this billion dollar number is actually the number that has him in court right now. There is no billion dollar property that belongs to Donald Trump. And he keeps saying this. I would hate to be his lawyer wise. What about you, man? Yeah, I think what Donald Trump is is trying to get away with is this idea that like he's who can say what the actual value assigned to his property is, right? And I think the truth of the matter is was going to be hard, a little bit harder for the prosecution is that Donald Trump probably could come out and say, look, I, I can sell this to some Saudis tomorrow for a billion. I bet you, you know, all of the connections that he made while in office in order to enrich himself um, I wouldn't be surprised if he could deploy those connections um, in ways that would be able to, if not exonerate him, um, sort of pacify the prosecution in a way that they couldn't come all the way down on him, right? Um, and that's the tricky thing about value and properties and, you know, capitalism in general. A lot of this stuff is made up and fake anyway. And Donald Trump is like, how are you trying to assign a true value to something that I still own? Um, and thereby, I still get to invent 
what what the actual value um of it is. So I think with the with the valuation thing, um he has a little bit more credence than than one would expect, especially since he still owns it. Because you can say, I think this is worth X, Y, and Z. This is the only way I would ever sell this because it's worth this, while you know not having any actual suitors. Yeah, I think the problem though is Donald Trump himself and his organization, right? It's not just that he values it at a billion dollar. He chooses to devalue well, it when yeah. it benefits him. Yeah. So I think that's what's gonna <laughs> yes. hurt Donald Trump, yes. right? It ain't just that, it ain't just that he valued it at a billion. That's on when he's trying to get money from banks and other organizations. It's when it's time to pay taxes that he says, well, it's only worth 27 billion. And I think those were his, I mean, 27 million, and those are his words himself. So that's going to be the problem. And I, I think as it pertains to him violating gag orders, we can go back to what uh, Judge Engeron, his gag order prohibit Trump already from attacking the court staff. Now, this is going to be the tricky part. Do we consider Attorney General Letitia James a part of the court staff? And I think that is what's going to make it tricky uh, for us to determine, has he has he already violated this gag order? Which, I mean, if this isn't it, Trump, we like you said, we know Trump, nothing's going to stop him. And he's probably going to fundraise off the idea that they lock him up or find him in violation of gag orders, even when they're spelled out. I think what's funny to me, though, is the willingness of Republican of Republicans in general to sit with Trump when they claim they are the party of law and order as he single-handedly dismantled every level of justice in this country. So, I mean, imagine someone black coming at the Justice Department, coming at FBI agents, coming at court officials in this manner or doxing an elected official in this manner. It wouldn't even be this way. And uh, <laughs> was, like I said, you're not a black man. We wouldn't dare show up in court and do this to judges or, or the attorney generals. I mean, this goes without saying. Um, I, I don't, and, and and it's not even just as a black man. I think even somebody who's a prominent black man, a rich black man, um, this this behavior would would not be allowed to stand. Uh, that that's just obvious. But I think that's what Trump has done largely. And as, now, as far as the Republicans are concerned, these people they're not going to relinquish power. Uh, they see that Trump is the only person in the party with any kind of juice with actual voters. He's the only person in the party who actually has a large constituency, a quite loyal constituency. And they know the second that they go against that, that's essentially career suicide. And these politicians, we've seen it. And um, unfortunately, on both sides of the aisle, these people let go of power through their dead gray hands, oftentimes literally in the case of Dianne Feinstein. Um, the, it's just not something that we see these guys do. Relinquishing power, influence, um, and control is, is not what they've been willing to do. I think if there was a Republican party that like actually cared about honor or integrity, they would basically, you know, branch themselves off from, from Donald Trump and start from scratch. But they know that would put them out of power completely. And so the idea that they would, you know, go out and do that, yeah, that, that would just never be the case. So things like, Again, honor, integrity, uh, morality, principles, that, that just goes out the window every single time. Yeah, but I think it's the thing that, that baffles me as a, a, politi a politician, not just elected official, but someone who has spent 20 plus years working on 163 campaigns is Donald Trump is a losing strategy outside of the Republican primary. I mm. think that's the problem, that closed primary system and also the drawing of these districts, the gerrymandering of these districts have ramifications where Republicans can't speak truth. Even those who want to be conservative can't show up in that manner unless they're honoring Donald Trump, which in actuality is anti-conservative a lot of ways, i.e. his massive tax cut that didn't do anything except for expand the deficit of this country larger than any uh, before the Bush one, right? So I think, I think you're right where Donald Trump has a stronghold on the Republican Party, but it doesn't just hurt the Republican Party, it hurts this entire country because we are a two-party system. When one of them is not functioning properly, when one of them shows up in this manner, we are left stuck. You're obviously completely right, but uh, you know the only way I would uh, stray from what you said is that it, it would assume that these guys are interested in governing. Um, you you know, uh, as the second these these people leave office, they walk into very cushy jobs. So if you become a Republican in a really safe district, and all you got to do up there is do the bidding of you know capital and these these special interests, it's the second you leave office. You are going to get paid, and, and that's a motivating factor as any.
Yeah. And I mean, and just not to drag on the story, you just you made a great point. And you don't even have to leave office. Right. We know right, <laughs> right. now this this temp- <laughs> right. think about this temporary the temporary speaker of the house. Uh, this brother came in, he's Republican, came in uh, worth nothing more than his house, representing the 10th district in North Carolina. And now he's he's one of the richest people in Congress. And this is what happens. And I don't understand how you can make a certain amount from the federal government that does not make you rich, but you can take all this money. You can keep taking. This is a broken system. Speaking of broken systems, brother, this next story is a real doozy. 53-year-old Leonard Allen, this is this is this is bad. 53-year-old Leonard Allen Cure uh, was the first person to be exonerated by the conviction review unit of the Broward County's uh, state's attorney office in Florida. Cure has spent more than 16 years behind bars after being wrongfully convicted of a violent crime in Broward County. And now, according to authorities, Cure was shot and killed by a Georgia deputy during a traffic stop Monday morning. Man, that's rough. Broward State Attorney Harold F. Pryor said Monday in a statement he was devastated after hearing the news that Leonard was was who he knew was a smart, funny, and kind person. After he was freed, he visited prosecutors at every at their office and participated in training to help our state staff <clears throat> do their jobs in the fairest and most thorough way possible. Brother, I want to stop right there. I don't know how to talk about this without getting choked up. I'm a mayor in North Carolina. North Carolina has one of the highest black men on death row that have been exonerated by this very project, the Innocent Project, out of any state. 33% of black men, 33% of the people who have been freed from the Innocent Project in North Carolina were black men, and some of them came home after doing 33 years, 40 years, 16 years, 20 years, and committed suicide. But to hear this brother got killed in a traffic stop, I apologize to the audience for being emotional, but I knew some of those brothers. And to hear that this brother came home and was killed in a traffic stop um, after he not only didn't give up on the justice system after they ar- arrested and convicted him wrongly for 16 years, still working with the prosecutor office, the same office that sent him there to ensure that it didn't happen to anybody else is horrible and wrenching to me. Um, Wise, what do you say about this? I mean, I, I don't see how it could get any worse than this, right? Uh, to to lose 16 years of your life, um, people just see that number, um, and they don't really understand that in those 16 years, it's 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 birthdays, it's family members passing away that you didn't get a um, chance to spend with. It's a lot of firsts. It's a lot of just milestones that you miss out on. Um, just big chunk of your life. That you miss out on. And that's before you even consider the conditions of a lot of the penitentiary system, right? Um, a lot of the a lot of the ways these these brothers and sisters have to live uh in the penitentiary are quite inhumane. Um it, it, it's quite awful, just the conditions that they have to live with. So you think about those two things compounded um with the fact that the guy was wrongfully convicted. Uh it, it's an injustice that's unspeakable. And now you know, to have his actual life taken away at a traffic stop with a cop where, you know, everybody watching the show today, um, what <laughs> we can disagree on a million things, um, but everybody agrees that nobody should walk away from a should everybody should be able to walk away from a traffic stop. Um, that shouldn't be a life ending uh altercation or situation. So that's tragic. Obviously, my thoughts and my heart goes out uh to this man's family. Um, again, this it, this is a miscarriage of justice that goes beyond anything. Yeah, man, I think uh, I think you're absolutely right. And let, let's get into some of speaking of the traffic stop and how people should walk away. Let's get into some of the details, according to uh, Omar Ortiz, uh, Ortiz from the Miami Herald. At about 7.30 a.m., a Camden County deputy stopped Cure as he was driving on Interstate 95, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation said in a statement, Cure complied with the officer's commands including getting out of the car, the Georgia State Agency noted, until police told him he was under arrest. 
They carry, uh, uh, Ortiz goes on to say, after not complying with the deputy's request, the deputy tased Cure, the GBI said. Police say Cure then assaulted the deputy who subsequently ta- used the taser for a second time and an ASP baton. Again, like, like I said, that's according to uh, Rodriguez, oh, Omar Rodriguez at Miami Herald. However, Cure still did not uh, comply according to the GBI. Uh, the deputy pulled out his handgun and shot Cure. According to the uh, Georgia State Agency, paramedics treated Cure, but he later died. In a Tuesday email, GBI Special Agent Stacy Carson told the Miami Herald that Cure was pulled over and placed under arrest for reckless driving and speeding. Omar Rodriguez Ortiz, uh, this is from the Miami Herald. They said there's a video, there's video footage, but it's not being released at the time. She said prior said Cure was working toward being buying his house, buying his first house and going to college, something that he'll never get to do. He had been working in a job uh, in security. He was hoping to go to college and wanted to work in broadcast radio production. He was buying his first home. This is what Pryor said. Um, and again, it was according to the Miami Herald. Innocent Project of Florida Executive Director Seth Miller, whose organization collaborated with the Conviction Review Unit to get justice for Cure, said his team is also devastated. And in a statement late Monday night added, we will do all we can to support Lenny's family. Lenny, of course, is uh, Leonardo's uh, nickname and all who knew him and loved him. According to Miller, Cure had visited his mother in South Florida and was heading back to his home outside of Atlanta when he was killed by deputies. In November 2003, Cure was arrested for the robbery. We should say wrongly arrested for the robbery of a Walgreens drugstore in Dana Beach and was convicted of armed robbery with a firearm and aggravated assault with a gun the following year. Cure was in his in his 30s at the time of sentencing, um, the sentence of life imprisonment, spending more than 16 years. In his 30s, spending more than 16 years, the most important years uh, could be argued, most important years uh, being incarcerated. In April 2020, Broward County's uh, Conviction Review Unit found in 2019 to investigate uh, the case. Mm, let me Let me say that clearer. The Conviction Review Unit, founded in 2019 to investigate this uh, cases that warranted a second look, recommended a modification of Cure's sentence to allow for his uh, immediate release as they reviewed his case. Soon after the court for the 17th Judicial Circuit modified Cure's sentence to this time served, he was re- uh, he was released. Let me stop right there. I mean, this is this is this is part of my problem with organizations uh, finding fault in how people are sentenced, how cases are sentenced. They didn't need to they didn't need to modify his sentence. They need to undo his sentence, because once you find that, that there's evidence that show that this case was mishandled, that you guys did something wrong. And they go on to say that there was information that show that. So they, they show witnesses multiple pictures of this man to make it look like or give the idea that he was the person that did it in the lineup. And also uh, when they were trying to identify who was guilty, all of that right there should have said, okay, at this point, we need to redo this trial, which also means at this point, we need to make this an innocent man, not someone that is put out of a jail on this idea that we are still trying to review and see what happened. I I think people forget that it's this level of muckery in our justice system that make black men continue to be skeptical of anything that looks like justice in this com- on this country. Furthermore, to find out that this man was tased two times, then shot without knowing what type of assault, allegedly assaulting he did to the police officer and then refusing to show this tape is why we sit idle and question the GBI, the same agency that did not want to arrest the white men who killed Ahmaud Arbery until there was national social pressure. I think the idea idea that we can ask us people that look and think like me that we should be silent until we find out what's going on or today tell us what's going on is a bad mixture my friend what do you what do you say was yeah absolutely not uh these these authorities these institutions have not earned the goodwill of the people i think you know was just born over the course of time that the system is quite broken um, if it if constantly people are falling through the cracks this way. And so this idea that they should get the benefit of the doubt and the people should just fall in line with every single decision that they make, uh, they haven't earned that level of credibility. 
And so I, I, obviously I, I vehemently de- deny, but um, I vehemently disagree with that. And as far as you said, um, by overturning it, they should have overturned his conviction. You know, as well as anybody that these DAs and these courts, they hate doing that. They sort of hate correcting the record. They almost treat it as if um, it's like a like a sport and their win loss record is being called into question. And, it, and it's not about the lives of actual individuals, actual flesh and bone people, the way they treat these cases, even when they see that the evidence that they use was shoddy at best. Some of it feels like they feel like it's it, it's a bit of a, you know, this will be like the domino effect that will have to question most of their cases. But I say, man, that's rightfully so. Um, if you're conducting investigations in such a shoddy manner that you're sending a bunch of people to prison for no reason, then, yeah, that's that should definitely be the case. People will go on to say, because we found out, you know, in October 2022, the review unit concluded the case against Curious so weak that it's given rise to a reasonable doubt as to his culpability and that he's most likely innocent. And in December of that same year, the court vacated Curious' judgment and sentence. He was officially exonerated days later. And in June of that year, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a claim bill granting him 817000 in compensation for his wrongful conviction. That's, of course, according to Omar Ortiz at the uh, Miami Herald. Listen, I don't want people to think that $817,000 is a lot of money for your life. That's about $51,000 a year as salary. That's So consider if that man was out in his 30s to uh, mid 40s, throughout his 40s, he would have been making $51,000 a year. That's what that's equivalent to. But that doesn't account for the trauma he has, uh, that's associated with being separated from your family, being locked in a prison and treated like an animal. And we already know the context in which American prison system exist. So I think that 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 number is not enough to compensate someone who did that, especially to find out he comes home and be killed by the same justice system. Uh, Why as you get the last word, brother? Yeah, again, I, there, there's no there's no words that can describe this. Um, I just hope that his family is able to get, you know, their hands on some level of resources in order to move forward in all of this. Um, My heart breaks for them. Um, This is just an unimaginable tragedy and think that, you know, that a citizen would die at the hand of the state, the very people that are tasked with protecting us, um, you know, just makes it that much worse. Yeah, indeed. Um, Listen, y'all, this is Wise and Mundell. We're filling in for Dr. Ritchie on Indisputable. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Hey, y'all, we're back. And um, I just want to do a small reminder for you all that don't forget, you can shop over at TYT. Official indisputable merchandise can be found at shoptyt.com. Find your your favorite TYT show designs and other activist apparel at shoptyt.com. Wolf Dragon Donna said, Mundell and Wolves, two of my absolute favorite guys. Happy Wednesday, y'all. Happy Wednesday to you. And thank you so much for being a member. Uh, over, Over still at TYT, some of our members thinking about uh, over 9,000. Can this rich, evil man please hurry up and get to the find out phase? Yeah, because he's been, he's been effing around for a long time, over 9,000. Here's the, here's the sad part about it. It's, it's this, this is the norm when you are a rich, white man. America is set up for this space where you can, you can move and act in this manner if you are uh, what Trump is. Of course, she's talking about Trump threatening Letitia James, uh, who's the attorney general in, it, in this case in New York. Also, um, a next TYT reporter, stay, stay with that. I like that energy. You don't need to apologize for being emotional, Mayor. It's why we watch this show. You guys care, and that matters. Thank you and appreciate that. We do care, and I think this is why you catch uh, so much emotion uh, and, and also in the stories that we cover that are not on mainstream um, because there's more to it. Move over to YouTube, and we got a sinful solution. Trump likes to talk to tier justice system. He's right but not in the way he thinks. I mean, we, we absolutely are talking about that in our second story where we saw someone uh, that did 16 years find out, come out and get killed in a traffic stop. So there definitely is a two-tier system that Trump is not suffering from at all. The fact that he's out on bail and still threatening elected officials or putting people's address on lets us know exactly what that looks like. And then just one more comment over from Twitch. A uh, man who who did 16 years was exonerated. We're talking about that case. We got uh, Mr. White. YF, uh, he he reunion lives and still gets to live and still gets to live uh, his. 
That's the great injustice. I'm not sure what you're trying to say, brother. Maybe I'm misreading it. I definitely tried to read you on air. Uh, watch out for typos, y'all, because uh, I'm going to read them as they come across. All right. <laughs> now, getting to the show, I wish a Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're going to feel free. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. I can't wait for the officer to get here. I can't either. I think you're out of your mind, lady. It's a motorcycle. What? Do you think it's any different? I can park wherever I want to. This is not in front of line. my... I can do whatever Not when my vehicle yes, is parked here. Your what vehicle makes, wasn't parked my here. My motorcycle was. It's a vehicle. It's a registered vehicle with the no. DMV. Yes. No. What are, is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Oh, my God. This is going nowhere. You can't reserve an entire parking spot. You're out of your mind. And, yeah, it's a and it's car. parallel it's a, parked. Because, so I take up one spot. You're welcome. I'll take up two from now on. Okay. You can't reserve yes, I can. Spot, no, you can. I can take up as many as I want. No, 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 my vehicles are registered you're not here. To store I'm not storing here. It's anything. Part, it's part of your lease. I write it every day. It's part of your lease, and I hope this goes. It's viral. not part oh, of my lease. I hope it, this goes viral. Uh, my uh, my car is on crazy. my lease. It literally my motorcycle is on my lease. It literally costs money to reserve a parking spot on this parking lot. It doesn't cost anything. Yes, you pay eight dollars a month, yes, and you can park anywhere you want. That's not true. What? What? You're not what? allowed to reserve a parking spot. I'm not There's reserving anything. Spots you don't here. need to reserve There's anything. There's reserved parking spots here. No, you don't. Hey, can you help me? Oh, my God. This. <laughs> she, yeah, she's crazy. We have parking spots here, so. Okay, well, I'll gladly you take up two from now on. Somewhere else. I don't need to. I have I it registered here. I don't need to go all the way over there. Go I don't away. need to. Please go away from my car. I don't trust this you. You already vandalized lot. it. This is a public parking lot. Okay. I can stand wherever I want to. Here's the cop. Here's the right, cops, here. right here. The cop telling her if she parks in front of my bike again, I can have it towed. And if she touches my car again, she was going to be arrested. She stomped off like a child. <laughs> Listen, I'm over here giggling, but in actuality, man, this level of unbelievableness has become so common right now. Here's a, here's a few things. First of all, in the video itself, you can see three or four open parking spots so close to that parking spot. I don't even know why we're having this conversation. The idea that you would block someone thing in talking about you can't reserve this been a public parking spot. She's contradicting herself every time she opened her mouth wise. Here's the problem, though. Here's the problem. This behavior could be so dangerous in certain situations. Mm -hmm. First, you don't know what kind of accident someone could or emergency someone could have. And you have them blocked in just because you're being spiteful. You call the police department and have a police officer come out there over a parking space when the parking lot itself isn't even full. First, you're calling it a place you can't park unless you pay. And then in the same sentence, in the same video, you're saying it's a public parking lot. It can't be public if you're paying people. This is absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. And I think this behavior, man, is speaking to where we find ourselves, the toxicity that exists in America right now. The privilege is on fleek in this video, was. Yeah, I, I I just struggle with this lady um, and her reasoning here. Uh, there's clearly other places to park. Uh, clearly, the 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 other woman was parked legally within the bounds of the rules. And all I can think of, and and listen, I'm not trying to body shame or anything shame, but she might have just wanted to be as close as possible to where she was trying to go, and she didn't care who was parked where. She was going to put her car as close to the destination as was possible. That's the only explanation that I could come up with. And again, I'm just putting context clues together, brother. I I, I don't know, because otherwise, you know, being this antagonistic, you know, to your neighbor over a parking spot when there's plenty more to go around, I, I just can't even come up with another explanation here. Yeah, I mean, I think the explanation is Privilege. I mean, because if you mm. consider it, if your if your motive is to get to where you're trying to be as fast as possible, she killed that by calling the police, standing oh, out arguing, so true. arguing with this other woman, right? Like, so this idea that you, I mean, even you trying to give her the benefit of the doubt don't even add up. And the fact that she said you can't reserve parking means that she probably was upset that the motorcycle had a cover on it because I heard the uh the one that was filming say I had a cover on it because it was raining. If you have a motorcycle, if you have any car, you have the right to protect it if you want to. And I think what mm. happens is 
this idea that she was just looking for reason, just kept grabbing at different reasons, spoke to the problem that this person had. <clears throat> this idea that you park parallel. It's a motorcycle. You can park it sideways in most parking spots. So that, was, that wasn't even a problem. It wasn't in two parking spots. And this person even said, hey, I paid for two extra parking spots. So if I want to, I can literally park my bike in two parking spaces and still not be in violation of the space that I paid for. So uh, I think this, this, like you said, this, this, there may be a reason, but to me, it seems like privilege. And what, what, what say you? And then we'll move on beyond this, this shenanigans. You know, you're probably right about that. And something else that comes to mind, she might have seen this woman pull up in the, on a motorcycle before in the past and just felt away. Maybe she wants to get on a motorcycle and can't. It might just be some hateration, holleration going on um, over there, Mondell. Like it's, it's quite possible when people get, you know, all jealous and hateful, they do some of the sillier things that we see. That again, you know, in a different context, this lady calling the police and escalating, you know, this into a law enforcement matter for a simple parking situation is just dangerous. Yeah, man. And speaking of dangerous and also uh, hateration, let's talk about some stuff going on in what in the red state hell. You can take a gun, shoot somebody in the face. It's not hard. Sometimes it might even be fun if they're a godless commie. Now, what they're trying to do is sneak the COVID vaccine in your salads. I never had, I hate math. Somebody say amen. Uh, I don't think we can have a Palestinian state at this point. I've had it with the Palestinians. I've given up on the Palestinians. If I was in Israel, I wouldn't be talking about a Palestinian state right now. I don't think Joe Biden should be talking about a Palestinian state right now. And I don't like how people tried to differentiate between the Palestinians and Hamas. To me, I see people with guns. That's Hamas. The people without the guns are the Palestinians. They believe the same thing. The Palestinians hire Hamas to run their government. You pull them, they all love killing Jews. It's in their charter. They say they believe in suicide bombings. Every time a Palestinian refugee goes to another country, it doesn't work out so well. For the other country and for those Palestinians, no one wants them. You don't see Egypt opening up their doors. You don't see Jordan opening up. You don't see the Saudis. Why don't they want the Palestinians, Dana? I think we all know why they don't want the Palestinians. And it's Jeez. During Monday commentary on Fox News, The Five, Jesse Waters revealed he doesn't see much difference between Palestinians, a population that includes children and women and people that are not a member of the terrorist group Hamas. Despite what Waters thinks, Palestinians are in an unrelenting nightmare. Al Al Hill uh, Arab Hospital is a gruesome sight the morning after Tuesday's night airstrikes. This is from Al Jazeera. 3,000 people who survived missile attacks in other parts of Gaza had come to take refuge at Al Ahil, where they slept in the garden courtyard and in the upper floors of the hospital building. Those who were not among the at least 500 people who were killed in Tuesday night attack walked around dazedly, collecting what belongings were still usable or helping retrieve dead bodies and body parts. Like I said, that's again from Al Jazeera. It goes on to say in Al Jazeera, the Palestinian health ministry said at least 3,300 people have been killed in Gaza and 11,000 wounded in Israel air raids. Another 1,200 people across Gaza are believed to be buried under the rubble, alive or dead, according to the same health authorities. Reportedly, reportedly at least half of those who have been killed were children. My God, I, 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 at this point, I think when we, when we see uh, the conservatives and people all over social media, X, what used to be Twitter, talking about this idea that there's no difference or no reason for Palestinians to exist, I'm left questioned and baffled by where's the humanity, where's the consciousness that exists, supposedly exists in their Christian religion uh, of this of this family value party, where they can say the death of millions, and in this case, thousands of people. Uh, is justified by what a small group or sect of folk are doing. The equivalent to this is saying that the KKK is enough for there to be no white people anymore in this country. That sounds drastic and harsh, but that is the exact equivalent they, the, uh, the, the exact equivalent they are making. But they will never say that 
And we will be criticized if we thought and saw the world in that manner. Wise, what about you? I think what you're seeing from Jesse Waters and a lot of the powers that be at this point, especially after the bombing of um, that hospital, which, you know, is only after comes after 6000 bombs have been dropped um, on, on Palestine uh, just recently. Uh, it's just a desperation. I think in the in the first days of, you know, the, the sort of Hamas attack, there was a lot of propaganda put out about, you know, uh, babies being beheaded on camera and this type of thing. And you saw that so that they could sod the ground for any type of response, no matter how indiscriminate or brutal the response was from the Israeli regime. I think they understand that public will, not just in the Arab world, but all over the place, will you know start to go against Israel once people start to see that this response is a bit not proportionate with what Hamas did. As heinous as that was, um, then that must be said. Nobody agrees with the death of any innocents, be they Palestinian or Israeli. Um, I think that's all you're seeing right there with Jesse Waters is desperation. They know the tide is going to eventually shift and people will not be for what Israel is currently doing in the Gaza Strip. Like it's inhumane. It's war. It's, it's a, they're committing war crimes right now um, in the way that they're attacking. And the last thing I'll say to address what he said about the Palestinians and some of their refugee statuses and um, the fact that certain Arab countries have not accepted Palestinians into their country with open arms. Forget about the merits of that. Um, and his, But let's just talk about his justification saying these people aren't great. Essentially, these people aren't people. Um, if Jesse Waters knew his history, he would know that at the founding of the state of Israel, whether you think that was legitimate or not, um, it was countries like the United States, countries like Great Britain, countries like France, who did not want to accept the Jews into their country. That was part of their justification for creating this new Jewish state. And their reason for doing so was extremely racist and anti-Semitic. They would, they would probably posit those at that time. Uh, the powers that be in the United States, Great Britain, even Russia would probably say something similar to, to what Jesse Waters is saying about the Jews. That's what they would have said. That would have been part of their justification for giving them their own country. So I would advise that guy to do his history um, and, you know, un have a better understanding about the situation on the ground over there than the history of that situation. Yeah, and I think it's important that people understand. I, I mean, I think and I'm not I don't need to speak for you because you did a great job just then that people need to understand that this what happened last week was not the beginning of what happened. This is right. 73 <laughs> years in the making. Right. This is yeah. this is this is what happens when you occupy people, when you shut down, when you have the ability to cut off their electricity, their water, their food supplies and everything else and put two million, two point five million people in a space that's the size of Detroit. You are building a, a, a reaction similar to what happened. And we do not condone what Hamas did, but we also do not equate Hamas with all Palestinians. And we definitely don't otherize them to the point that we don't see them as human and instead as collateral. But Manda, again, just, just again, just look at the damage, the devastation that has been wrought by the Israeli government. There is no single person saying that all Israeli citizens, no matter what, if Hamas had the capabilities of having the luxury of having American made weapons, that they should then come out and attack Israeli citizens in the same way that Palestinian citizens are being attacked in response. Nobody would make that claim. Everybody would say, look, that's what the military is doing. Obviously, non combatants don't deserve to bear the brunt of the actions of the military and the regime. Everybody understands that when it comes to Israelis. Nobody on that side seems to be making that same distinction when it comes to Palestinians. And I mean, we see that in mainstream media. Or, or, I mean, if you listen to mainstream media right now, over and over, their coverage looks like it's one side and that's it. Like you said, we dropped 6,000 bombs. You know, we didn't. Israel dropped 6,000 bombs in one week. That's the equivalent to what America dropped in uh, a year in Afghanistan. We're going to take a break and come back with more Indisputable. Hey, y'all, um, we're back. Operation Hope. We need to organize, amplify, be the change. 
This is TYST's public square for taking action on campaigns that will create real world change. Be part of the discussion, creation, organizing, and execution of change campaigns. Operation Hope is knowing that change is possible and that people can revive and save democracy. Join the Operation Hope community at tyt.com. Let's go over to some more uh, TYT member comments. Remember that we do break for comments. Uh, and also Mountain Dragon told us no one should ever listen to this joker. He's admitted to stalking and grooming an intern of Fox News while he was still married. Jesse Waters is disgusting. I mean, this is absolutely right. This, not just this, his, his playing with important issues, his lying and carrying on of not just conspiracy theories, but conspiracy theories about the state of our democracy is extremely dangerous. And we should acknowledge that and also condemn not just him, but the network that gives him a platform over and over again. Moving over to uh, YouTube, we got Dystopia Dragon. Thank you so much for that. Uh, as species, humans, yuck. Um, then we also, <laughs> yeah, I think that's correct. We have uh, Made in Laos, who said uh, she has the case of the stupid. I think she's talking about the Karen was in the fact that she kept on wasting not only state resources by calling the police, but her argument with all there was so many parks. Over on Twitch, we got uh, Sunglass Tony. This miserable person, she only feels better when she's trying, when she tries to drag people down to her level, sick. I'm assuming we're talking about the Karen again, because what we saw was absolutely a horrible situation of how you treat your neighbor and also how you not get promoted on the neighborhood watch committee. <laughs> uh, lastly, we'll read another comment from over at Twitch. We got our Winston 12, 1880, Waters is auditioning for the role of leader of the American Taliban. I don't think so. I think the uh, Taliban, with all of its problems, uh, uses a religion uh, in a way that is not proper, I think, as it pertains to trying to push a political motive. Waters have no political motive. He has no background. He's only there to be rich or to enrich himself and push a narrative that he sometimes don't believe. And we know that because they've been caught, not just him, other uh, people at Fox have been caught with hot mics. So we know that this is not about some kind of grand scheme. This is just about them making themselves relevant with a certain demographic, with a certain population. And that to me is equally disgusting, if not more of what the Taliban stands for. So let's get back into the show, Waz. We got so much to cover. Um, right now, former basketball coach threatened to shoot students. Ed Medek, a Fresno City College professor and former basketball coach was arrested Friday after making threats while teaching a class on August, 13, August the 15th to harm people on campus, according to the campus police. In a timely warning notification required by the Clery Act of 1998, he faces two felony counts for making threats against students and officials. This is crazy to me. FCC students didn't find out until Monday morning about the arrest. While teaching a class, Mr. Medek allegedly made threats against college officials and students in general, stating that he should he would shoot them, the police department said in the notification. This is, of course, to, according to Thaddeus Miller at the Fresno B. The State Center Community College District Police detailed that Medek compared bullet points in a PowerPoint presentation to bullets flying towards students. This is from uh, Stephen Price over at KSEE. I want to stop right there for a minute. Why did people not find out about this until Monday? Why didn't <clears throat> why didn't was someone know about this? Why didn't they let people know when it happened? I can't I can't for the life of me understand what kind of reporting system you got where people one allowed the class to continue or allow him to continue to teach more classes without addressing this fact, brother. Well, I would say, uh, come on, Mondell. You know how bureaucracies work. They 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 had to get the ass covering mode first. First thing they're going to do when they get the report is, quote unquote, investigate. Um, and then they're going to make it public after they dotted their I's and crossed their T's as far as liabilities and things like that are concerned. That always comes first in every single um, bureaucracy. It's like, how do we cover ourselves first? Um, and then maybe if we could figure out how to make sure the students are good and the rest of the faculty and staff were not in harm's way, maybe we'll get that situated. But first, they keep themselves employed. They keep themselves, you know, in power before anything. That's what I would attribute any delay to. That always seems to be the case. Yeah, and I think that case might have hurt them because according to Stephen 
uh, Stephanie Price over at KSEE. They had a letter, a letter from a Medique's attorney, Robert Carroll, and that stated the information against him was incorrect and wrong. On August 22nd, 2023, Ed Medique arrived at Fresno City College to teach his class and was told uh, he was being put on administrative leave for allegedly threats made on August 15th. Between August 15th to the 22nd, Mr. Medique had taught at least five classes on campus. The school took no action for seven days. That fact alone cast doubt on these allegations. And that's, of course, mm. according to Carol's attorney, speaking exactly to what smart. we said. This delay absolutely is smart, and it's mm. absolutely scary that they allowed this man to go into the classroom for seven days. Like you said, while they were trying to, we don't know this to be true, but it sounds like it could be plausible. Build a case to defend themselves, not protect the students. They gave this man five more days, seven more days to threaten and possibly even do some harm to students that he said bullet points represent flying at these students. That is not protecting the students. That is protecting image for whatever reason. It goes on to talk about Madik was placed on administrative leave following the class in August. He was arrested about 2 p.m. Friday in Mercer in Mr. County. He was taken to Fresno County Jail, but has since posted bail, police said. Given the nature of the alleged threats, police said anyone on campus should not approach him, but rather call 911 or campus police. Of course, that came from the Fresno B and that is Miller. Oh, Miller. Here's my problem. What, did, what does the police officer mean? Anyone on campus should not approach him. Did they not ban him from campus while they figure this out, while they investigate this? Can someone please explain to me why this teacher still has access or if this teacher still has access to the uh, the students on that campus and the officials who he threatened? Wise, what do you think about that? Again, <laughs> none of this stuff surprises me, especially as it pertains to staff. I, I, I can just see these guys sitting around like they get the report. Somebody saying, hey, let's step in. Let's let's just you know what? We don't have to, to strip this guy of any pay. Let's just. Put him on leave immediately. You know, if we do this investigation and it was a misunderstanding, you know, he wasn't financially impacted. We can get somebody to replace this guy um, and, and, and come in and teach for him in the intervening time and keep it pushing that way. Instead, again, they go into the opposite mode and drag their feet, of course, which which I can't, it's hard for me to, to give them the benefit of the doubt when these things get handled this way. It doesn't seem like the the sort of um safety of the students was put first it's hard to believe that was the case if this kind of allegation is levied and he's still allowed to show up to work the next day yeah and i mean like it's not like he was teaching um and i'm not demeaning any education it's not like he was teaching a a, a mandatory course in this in the science or the social science uh he's a he's a physical ed teacher so the college wouldn't have went under without physical ed uh, <laughs> even if they couldn't find even if they couldn't find a replacement for him immediately right he formerly coached the Fresno City College men's basketball team and then spent less than a full season at Buchanan's High School as a coach. Madik was removed as the college coach and placed on paid administrative lead. Look at this. In February 2020, with one regular season game remaining because of an alleged violation over snacks and team barbecues. This is, of course, according to the free break. <laughs> this story is getting weird and weird. Maybe he brought chicken barbecue instead of pork barbecue, and maybe he brought um some the wrong snacks to go along with the barbecue. I can't even understand what's going on here. I want to know more about this story and also how is this guy continually put on administrative leave and given this pass when we see a current behavior pattern that is, that's forming here. Uh, Watts, how yeah, do you like I, your barbecue? I've, I've been on record many a times on, on this platform that like I don't think people should just lose their jobs in America willy-nilly. Um, when we consider the the lack of a social safety net, basically, if you don't, if you're not drawing a paycheck, you are completely on your own. However, when people are messing up at work, like they should be getting better at what they're messing up at, they shouldn't be getting put over and over on administrative leave because people are constantly complaining about them. Like, yeah, do better, brother. <laughs> like, holy yeah. moly. This story has more points of doing better than we believe, starting with the pain of Aaron Rodgers. The New York Post's uh, Andrew Marchand reported that Pat McAfee pays millions 
to Aaron Rodgers for guesting on his show, and McAfee took offense to the report. Though McAfee personally messaged Merchant, Merchant and partially confirmed his report by saying that he's paid Aaron Rodgers over $1 million for sure, McAfee still called the sports media columnist a rat. A rent. <laughs> Martin also reported that McAfee also pays nearly $1 million per year to University of Alabama uh, football coach Nick Saban for interviews, but claims that McAfee isn't the only one in the media who is paying people for interviews. Listen, McAfee, who signed a five-year deal with ESPN, reportedly worth around $85 million certainly seems to have gotten his money's worth. Aaron Rodgers Tuesdays have become an appoint, appointment viewing for NFL fans and Rodgers presence unquestionably helped raise the profile of the show. Every week, his comments are uh, aggregated and shared across social media. McAfee told Marchant and that Rodgers deserves much more than what he's gotten for the time and effort he's put into Aaron Rodgers Tuesdays. This is, of course, according to uh, Joseph Zucker at Bleacher Report. I want to stop. And listen, man, this idea that journalism is are paying people on the topic that they're covering and then still want to be taken serious. First of all, it's hard <laughs> to take them serious. It's hard to take them serious for a lot of reasons. But this idea that you're paying them this much money, uh, not you're not just jeopardizing your reputation. You have the whole network of ESPN looking silly when they let go so many quality so many quality uh, journalists to bring your show on. And then we found out they gave you $85 million plus you an uh, extra budget to pay Aaron Rodgers. I would much rather listen to Jalen Rose and Aaron Rodgers anytime about any sport. It's interesting because obviously this is, you know, this is, this is my industry. This is what I do for a living. And, you know, for people at home to understand, like in hardcore sports journalism, um, it is absolutely considered to be unethical to pay your interview subjects. That is, that is, um, that's not something you do, right? Um, it, it damages your credibility. Um, it's obviously a conflict of interest. If somebody is getting financial gain from speaking to you, the information that you're getting from them can obviously your relationship with the person is, is obviously now being called into question. You're like your objectivity, your ability to cover this person in the future is now compromised. Like everybody knows that. I think the problem is that in sports in particular, as media and journalism, it's so, you know, verging on entertainment, so much of sports media that those lines get blurred. Even Pat McAfee himself, a former football player, um, he's, he's going to say, I'm not a journalist. I'm out here entertaining. Aaron Rodgers is my friend. His presence on my show enriched me. And I think he deserves to get paid for it. That's the way he sort of spun this. I think the problem is mostly for outlets like the outlet like ESPN, who has now brought McAfee in, um, that people can, I think, quite justifiably um, question the guy, their, their, um, the integrity of the Pat McAfee show and the information that they're getting when the two guys are so chummy, chummy and buddy, buddy. I would say, like, you know, the onus kind of is on the fans. Like, if you really want to watch athletes talk to their buddy, and be completely and wholly uninteresting and not give you any pertinent information, I guess that's on you. Um, I'm with you, Mondell. I would much prefer, honestly, the work of actual real sports journalists to just, you know, athlete, buddy, buddy, chummy, chummy stuff. I think uh, real journalists have a better sense of what makes athletes interesting than their own buddies do. But, you know, that's just me and my personal preference. Yeah, I mean, it's not just your personal preference. It is actually standard. It should be industry standard. And this shouldn't be a small story. And I think that's what's going to happen. I think uh, Martin's report is likely to bring more scrutiny upon uh, McAfee, given what's perceived as preferential treatment towards Roger and an unwillingness to push back against the more controversial remarks made by legendary, uh, that's questionable, legendary quarterback. Uh, <laughs> just that's of course uh, the, the the Bleacher Report as well. In one recent example, Rogers challenged Kansas City Chief star tight end Tracy uh, Travis Kelsey, who he dubbed as Mister Pfizer, to a debate on the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine. It wasn't the first time critics pointed out why on um, what they believe uh, was 
McAfee's allowing Rogers to spread vaccine mis misinformation. I don't even know why we have to put this word in here. Viewers didn't believe that Aaron Rodgers in the height of COVID has some ridiculous ideas, some ridiculous views. He's not a doctor. He's not a doctor, right? So this idea that we got to say that these are skeptical beliefs, this guy is ridiculous. He is a, he is, he was a, he was a anti-COVID vaccine. He had crazy ideas about what you could do to not get COVID. He spoke on things that he shouldn't have been speaking on and his policies and his, and this information going unchecked can lead to people dying, i.e. Donald Trump telling people to drink bleach and people not to take the vaccine. So this idea that you're calling uh, Kelsey, Mr. Pfizer, is a play on what science is. And I think unchecking this is the very reason this is unethical to be paying your friends to come on your show and then pretending like you're not paying them. And when I say pretending, if you are paying, if ESPN is paying someone a million dollars to do a segment, one segment a week, then you would normally see a background set up. But the way they carry the Aaron Rodgers interview is like he's at home lounging, just being interviewed on his own will. No, we should have known it up front that you were getting millions. We should have known up front that there was going to be no pushback when you say ridiculous ideas like uh, the vaccine didn't work. I mean, the, the lack of pushback is is always concerning. Again, uh, the, the proliferation of athlete led media um, has spread a lot over the years. Right. And I think some of my colleagues might look at them as competition. I honestly see it as just more content that we can cover as media. Um, yeah, but I think this is sort of the trade off of that. If you're a fan, like you're just going to get some of this chummy, chummy stuff. And to address Aaron Rodgers specifically in his quote unquote vaccine skepticism where I'm not going to lie. I kind of chuckled at the Mr. Pfizer thing because Travis Kelsey is literally doing commercials for Pfizer. Like he literally is in Pfizer commercials. So there is something a little bit funny about that. But what I would say to Aaron Rodgers and people like him is that one, we can say two things to be true. Um, that some of the COVID protocols across the country, varying from different states, might have been wrongheaded, inconsistent, and, and didn't make sense in a lot of ways that they ended up being implemented, right? For example, um, the rate of COVID deaths was no different from red state to blue state until the vaccine came. And because red states got vaccinated at way lower rates, the death rate spiked for them. Whereas in blue states, people who were less reticent to use the vaccine, people started dying at a lesser rate. Like, this is just a fact. This is true. So it can be true that some people might say, oh, the way we implemented uh, COVID protocols, maybe I think we kind of overreached or overstepped in certain places. Some people might disagree. I'm fine with somebody saying that. But the empirical evidence is that the vaccines freaking worked. And Aaron Rodgers and his ilk not being able to admit that nobody grew a third head or an 11th finger from taking the vaccine. Tens and millions of us did it. We're all fine. It's great. And the, the fact that they can't come back and just say, you know what, we might have been a little bit wrong at it on our end with our vaccine skepticism is why to me, people like Aaron Rodgers have no cred credibility on the subject. Yeah, no credibility. And then on top of that, not having credibility, we also got to acknowledge that you got people in his industry that helped bolster the BS between him and McAfee. When you see Stephen A. Smith, who told M. McAfee during a segment on air, quote, I want you to tell the public out there who's being critical and questioning of your relationship to kiss your ass. They wish they had the, the relationship. All of these people tell them to kiss your ass twice. That's right. That's a quote. Stephen A. It's ridiculous. So when you have the second highest or the first highest paid people talking about the vaccine and also the nature of that relationship as if it's normal, it's, you start questioning the entire dynasty that is Disney because Disney owns ESPN. And I mean, they, but we did see some pushback. However, it didn't come from inside the ESPN network. And I think the mass laying off of ESPN staff got people inside afraid to criticize the network. But Keith Oberman, being Keith Oberman, went ahead and did what he always does. And he said, this isn't difficult and it isn't nuanced. You can't pay some active athlete and not and pay others and still claim to be doing journalism. Go figure. He added ESPN has uh, has to terminate his relationship with Pat McAfee and, and do it immediately 
the entirety of his 44 years of credibility is at stake. I mean, I think, you know, this isn't the first time its credibility has been at stake. And I definitely don't think they're going to let go of their, their new golden child because he's drawn upon what what they thought they were going to lose because of their fight with DeSantis, which is, uh, you know, frustrated white men for the most part. Yeah, I mean, I, the, where I would disagree with Keith um, in that is, yeah, maybe the, the credibility with who? Certainly not their customers. I, I don't think that the average modal sports fan really gives a damn about journalistic credibility. I think, you know, poll after poll has shown that the public just generally has soured on journalism as an institution, just generally speaking. So the idea that ESPN's customer base would actually care about this, I tend to disagree with Oberman there. I myself, like, I don't know that, I don't find this to be offensive. I, I find football and football commentary to be kind of a bit laughable um, in, in most parts. Uh, especially when athletes are talking to athletes. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that ESPN is generally going to be like, oh my God, we're seen as this paragon of sports journalism credibility that they're going to, you know, really care too much. Again, this is ESPN. This is not, you know, the New York Times or, or the New Yorker or something like that. Some journalistic entity that's reporting on, say, the Israel and Palestinian conflict, right? Where life or death is on the line for these guys. These, these are people generally talking about dudes in tights throwing a ball around. Yeah, I think, but I think, you know, the important part to point out, and I think my little pushback on what you're saying, brother, is simply that journalism uh, of sports, coverage of sports should be the New York Times of sport. ESPN should see itself, or and it shouldn't be concerned not only with its viewers or the masses, but also with the ethic, the code of ethic associated mm. with journalism. And I think you're spot on. They're not going to be because it's not going to cost them a dollar. And right now, the world is more concerned with dollars than they are anything else. When we call athletes ambassadors of countries um, at the at the uh, at the Olympics, um, then I think we should help hold the people who are covering them to a higher standard. We're going to stick in it. We got more to cope. Uh, this is Indisputable Wise and Monday filling in for Dr. Richie. And we're back with uh, viewer comments. We're going to start with TYT members. Uh, by the way, first time watching Indisputable, teach me, gentlemen, and greetings from a new member that came from uh, KMJ. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that. I'm going to go over to YouTube and read uh, the Truth Dragon, New Jersey 09 or NJ09, I should say. And Republicans want to give teachers like this guns. That is a fact. We have people referring to bullet points on, on a slide as bullets find at students and, and Republicans thinks the answer is to uh is to arm these teachers, arm these people with guns. Makes no sense at all. Next up on Disputable, we're going to Michigan because guess what? The crazy doesn't just stop with elected officials. Right now, a 39-year-old Carl Mintz, a Michigan man was arrested after he allegedly made a post on social media threatening violence towards Palestinian Americans in Dearborn, a city near Detroit that has one of the highest populations of Arab Americans in the U.S. Uh, Mitz is facing one felony count of threat of terrorism and a misdemeanor count of malicious use of a telecom device. Police began investigating last Wednesday when they when they received an anonymous tip about a post that Mitz allegedly made online. He was arrested in his home in nearby Farmington Hills on Thursday. As part of his bond condition, Mitz was assigned a GPS tether device and was banned from possessing weapons and using the Internet. This is according to David Harris, Law and Crime. Dearborn Mayor Abdullah H. Ahmed Hamoud said in a statement, threats of violence against our community will not be tolerated and that his office was pleased to see the charges were filed. Listen, I, we got to we got to talk about this. I mean, this is this is not just about this is not just about international politics or geopolitical politics. This is about the climate that America has borne over the past, you know, uh, right since Donald Trump, since 2015, we've seen the the threats go up against elected officials. I myself um, currently am moving back and forth between different properties that I own because I was doxxed for turning down a Confederate monument and people constantly threatened me. So I think this idea that this is just related to one accident, and I don't want to make small the act, what's happening, the war between Israel and Hamas over in uh, the Middle East, but this this hate 
has been fermenting. We had the FBI tell us last year that the greatest threat to America right now is the rise in white terrorism. And this is no difference or cannot be separated from that. Uh, Waz, what do you think about that? I think a lot of people have been very thoroughly propagandized, uh, to be honest. Uh, just, just, just turn on the news and look at the news coverage and look how skewed some of it may be. Biden's own press secretary, um, she, she described any calling for restraint or, you know, a ceasefire or peace to be repugnant. <laughs> she said it would be repugnant to suggest that there should be a ceasefire and, and an end to the the mass deaths that we're seeing in that part of the world. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not surprised when people who are so thoroughly propagandized on a damn near daily basis lose their minds um, and are just filled with hate for certain groups. I, I can't say that I'm surprised by that. Just turn on what we see in mainstream media. It's not a message of peace and reconciliation. It's not a message of, yo, how do we figure out a way to, to, to bring forth a ceasefire between the Russians and the Ukrainians? How do we find a way to bring forth, bring forth a lasting peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians? It's, it's all about war and, oh, we're, we're sending this much aid to Ukraine, which realistically, guys, is just a wealth transfer to the weapons manufacturers in this country. I promise you. If the weapons that Ukraine had to had to use during that war were made in China, we would not be writing fifty billion dollar checks to them. I promise you, it is American private companies that we just basically give government funds to in order to fund those wars, and that's why we and that's why you see that posture, and that's why you see that rhetoric, um, and that's why I think I'm, that's why I'm telling you I'm not surprised when people are constantly bombarded with this propaganda. Um, believe these kind of crazy things. To us, they seem kind of crazy, but when you're only getting your information from space, like say Fox News, that seemingly go along with any, any conspiracy that Donald Trump is spewing or anybody on the MAGA right is spewing. You understand why the police chief uh, of Dearborn, Chief Issa Shahan, stated that department take all threats seriously because we live in a climate where you can't. And because they take all threats uh, seriously, they're currently uh, unaware of any other further threats, but they're still increasing the number of police that are you know, patrolling the city at places of worship and other public safety and security issues. Like this is ridiculous that you have to increase. We are in a state where we're increasing police presence at churches, churches and other places where people pray and worship. This is, but this is where we find ourselves, especially in a space where demographic states again, that Dearborn has one of the largest Arab American populations in the United States, accounting for 42% of the city's population in 2021. The city elected is first Arab uh, mayor. Like, so, I mean, I think, you know, in a space where you just got arrested in a climate in a country where we see the demonizing of the FBI and other justice department that are investigating white nationalists, it, it becomes no shock, no shock that people are, you know, are arresting folk while Israel and Hamas are uh, raging on in the Middle East, right? Just this week here in this country, uh, the arrest of a 71-year-old man in Illinois, the landlord, Joseph Sakuba, Azuba, who stabbed a woman and her six-year-old son because they were Muslim, stabbed them. The boy, uh, Wadia al-Fayomi, died while his mother suffered serious injuries. And Suzuba is facing a murder charge, a murder charge, while the DOJ is opening a hate crime investigation. I hate to say this, y'all, a hate crime investigation is not going to bring back this six-year-old who was stabbed just because of what he believed. And a lot of the time we forget that children are born in situations. So this child was killed because of his DNA. He didn't make a choice at seven or six years old to be a Muslim. He is a Muslim because his mother was a Muslim and this man killed him for that reason. So he was killed for being born and we don't say it that manner. And it's at this point, it's too late to try to charge this man with a hate crime. Yes, he should face murder charges, but what we should be charging is America and her silence for hate crimes because we already knew, the FBI already told us that this was the biggest threat to Americans. So every Muslim, every black person, every minority right now is at threat because of white nationalism. The most depressing part about all of this, Mondale, is the fact that we did this already 20 years ago. Um, we went through 9-11. 
We had those two absurd wars, absurdly expensive on the one hand, and even worse, 500 million plus dead Iraqis and Afghanis um, in the process. Uh, We stayed in Afghanistan for damn near 20 years. About seven hours after we left, the Taliban took over, all the good we did over there. Um, And, you know, not to mention all of the insane uh, uh, investigations and surveillance of fellow Muslim Americans here in America, just all the hate that we engendered towards these people for nothing. And we learned nothing from it. We're just repeating the cycle again now by, you know, painting Palestinians as murderous, uh, just, you know, horrible, monstrous people, the masses of them who deserve, you know, the most brutal repression imaginable um, to man. Indeed. And I think and I think, you know, we could talk about this forever. We could go on and ever about the oppression that's in, uh, built in to where we find um, our brothers and sisters in Palestine um, and the suffering that they're going through. In lieu of talking about it, I would much rather end this, the show on a lighter note out of sake of people's heart and spirit. Um, kind of lighter, but it's also just about the trickery of men in power. During an interview, we find this out, this story, during an interview at the New York Comic Con, director Matthew Vaughn claimed he was courted to replace Brian Singer as the director of 2006 X-Men, that's uh, The Last Stand, but he rejected the offer to direct the sequel after discovering a studio's executive plan to deceive Holly Berry into reprising her role as Storm. Vaughn was quoted as saying, one of the main reasons I quit X-Men 3, and this is a true story, Vaughn said, I went to an executive office and I saw an X3 script. It was a lot fatter. I asked, what is this draft? They were like, don't worry about it. I grabbed it and opened the first page and it said, Africa. Kids dying from the water and storm creates a thunderstorm to save all these children. This is according to Matthew Vaughn, New York Comic Con. He would go on to say, I thought this was a pretty cool idea. I said, what is this? They said, this is the Holly Berry script because she wa- she hasn't signed on yet. This is what she wants it to be. And once she signs on, we'll throw it in the bin. I thought, if you're going to do this to an Oscar winning actress who plays Storm, I quit. Barry ended up returning to Storm in X-Men The Last Stand, but the film did not include any scenes set in Africa as the script Vaughn read included. The Last Stand did, however, give Storm a more prominent role as the character take over as head of Charles Xavier's uh, School of Mutants after his death. Uh, there's there's been previous mistreatment Barry suffered during the X-Men franchise. Listen, I can continue to read about what happens to actors and actresses, but this idea that they had an entire script that they were going to duke her with, bruh, this is unbelievable. Um, and while it's not as serious as what's going on in the world politically, uh, this is some this is some wild thinking right here. It's, it's very it's quite diabolical um, to to sway the the feelings of of an actress. By saying, oh, in the movie, we're going to save the kids in Africa. And then only to pull the okie doke at the last minute so you could put her in another horrible Marvel movie. That is just, that is just awful. Just so sick. <laughs> Listen, it, it's not only sick, bro. You know what it, you know what, you know what it makes me think of? This is my problem. And a lot of black people gonna get mad about this. My problem with um with with Wakanda was this fact that. Oh. God. All they had, all they had to offer black people in America in Oakland was a nonprofit, and it like it's like how tone deaf are these people doing these movies? Nonprofit is in itself is a racist institution that usually oh, excludes black talk voices about it. and just talk it, it about just, it. It just make uh, wealthy people more wealthy through their foundations, hiring their family members. And I was like, Black Panther is offering black people a nonprofit when they have all the jewels that all the uh what what is that purple stuff they had vibranium <laughs> vibranium they had all this vibranium that could have fixed all the problems so the, the answer to black people in america's problem is a a nonprofit in oakland and i was just disgusted and it was well, like this is tone deaf well it's it's tone deaf but it's true to life you know whenever there are 
uh, resources in Africa, some colonial entity gets to come in and extract them for their own profits and their own goods um, to the detriment of the actual people. They never get to actually see any of the riches of the goods and the resources that are on their own land. This is where we see all over the place. This is the colonial project, Mondell. And so they, they're just giving you documentary form in a goddamn Marvel movie that's supposed to get these black folks excited. <laughs> Listen, and go see the movie eight or nine times. Listen, y'all, I think we're in a Put some Dashiki on. Put some Kente cloth on for this great colonialism, Mondell. Let's do it. Say, put it. Listen, everybody needs a Kente cloth. But I would, instead of having the cloth itself, let's have some Kente cloth policies to support yeah, that. Absolutely. And I would say that, uh, listen, this, this was a uh, great show, brother. Thank you so much for joining us. It it's a been pleasure. real. I would say this in closing, Wakanda forever. <laughs> 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 Respect, brother. Yo, thank y'all so much for tuning in for another episode of uh, uh, Indisputable with Dr. Richard. Once again, it's uh, Wise filling in alongside Mondale Robinson. Thank you so much. Welcome to Indisputable. I'm your host, Dr. Rashad Richard. We got a lot happening today. What do we do on this show? We tell the truth. You know why we tell the truth? Because the truth is simply indisputable. Rashad, great to be here. Congratulations on the new show. And I got to let everybody know that Rashad and I go way back. People still need health care, so I won't stop. People still need criminal justice systems reform throughout this country, so I won't stop. And you won't stop either.